let me uh, frame what we're going to talk about. Uh, the topic is humanizing technology. Uh, but I'm going to frame it on maybe on a slightly different way that you may be used to uh, talk about this topic. Uh, I'm going to frame it from a um, system thinking perspective, from almost, almost an engineering view of a problem that is a very non-engineering problem. Um, so I'm going to do that. And then um, Robin and I are going to have a discussion about the translation of that to the pragmatism of the future of work. So let me start with the end. Um, uh, we have a point of view. I have a point of view. Uh, I have a point of view that humanizing technology and making sure that we create systems where technology and humans, actually, we should call them people, not a thing called humans. Technology and people uh, work better together. It's not only you know, morally right or you know, um, something that we should do. It's actually just a better way to solve an engineering problem. It's a better way to get things done. And because of that, the people that become very good at that, the people that get very good at engineering for empathy, actually are going to solve problems faster, better, and are going to thrive, while others are going to continue to struggle. Um, like me with this clicker right now. Um, let, me, let me tell you what I mean by that. So let me, let me kind of like step back and set up the engineering view of the problem. Um, if you look at us as suspicious uh, for the last I don't know, 10,000 years, uh, one of the things that we grew uh, uh, doing very well is this concept of creating tools to enhance the limitations of who we are as humans. Uh, the other thing that we actually developed in a very uh, strong way was this ability to um, recreate what other person is perceiving to be true. And we call that empathy, right? It's the ability to see with somebody's eyes. The relationship with our tools, for the most part, with a couple of examples that you know, deviate, are fairly rational, mechanical. You know, uh, many of our tools have increased uh, strength of what we do. And then the bond uh, on how we read each other is mostly sub sub subconscious, right? So um, if you believe that framing, then think about that, right? So you have um, something that really actually made us the one in six uh, uh, species that survive as humans because of this empathy is a very, very, very strong element of how we understand the world, how we relate to each other. And then the rational pa part is actually the new, and I, I would say even weaker side of the brain. But most of the things we do in our daily lives seem to be targeted at that rational side. And with a number of exceptions, you know, you could say, well, language was the first tool that was created to expand human memory. You could basically put it there. Uh, or arts that eventually grew to be an emotional connectivity um, interface. We haven't really done much about it. I mean, think about it. Think about all the tools that we use. The interfaces between the human and the tool are very primitive. I mean, think about its pedals, its levers, it's a keyboard, it's a screen, it's actually very, very, very limited. And yet, that's where we spend most of our time. So again, going to the premise is, um, now we've created this technology that for the first time, we actually have a technology that can attempt to establish a relationship on the emotional side of the humans, on the subconscious side. So, um, so now what used to be just a one-way direction is becoming a two-way direction. And then the question is, OK, well, that's good. So you're saying, Jesus, AI could actually learn my emotional state. It could learn um, how to relate to me better. Why does that matter other than a great you know, science experiment? Well, let me get to that. Why is this important? Why is it important? that we take humans and technology and we optimize this interface, not only at a rational level, but at an emotional level. Well, it goes back to what uh, uh, a lot of people yesterday talk about how actually our cognition works. Uh, I think Moran did it better, which is we actually recreate the thing that we believe to be the truth. That doesn't exist outside. The, the thing that exists is light, sound, gravity, pressure, 
chemistry. That's about as much as we can detect from the outside. And as Moran said, it's very limited. And then we have this engine. That's what you would call data, you know, unrefutable data that is either a wavelength or that is not a wavelength. Um, and then we have this very complex function that invents what we perceive to be the truth. And the reason why empathy became so important to human race is because each of us have a different engine that does that. So the only way that people could understand each other beyond something rational was to develop this sixth sense called empathy, where you could somehow mirror the same formula that somebody else is using to create reality yourself, and then you can based on data, like if you're crying, I can emulate a state of sadness. It's not like you transmitted that, it's I recreated that. And that became a survival trait. That became what we are today. And the reason why that's important is because somehow through time we have convinced ourselves that we have free will and that we make good rational decisions. Um, Big fallacies, big fallacies, and I'm going to prove it to you in the next minute. Uh, actually, many others, I'm standing in shoulders of giants, many others that study behavioral economics have already made a lot of money on this very simple fact, which is we don't make decisions based on data or facts. We make decisions based on how they are presented to us. Because this engine that we have in our brain will recreate a reality not just based on the data, but based on the data and all the context around it. And what is that worth? Well, look at that. A very simple change in choice architecture. 401k, an experiment in the United States. Very simple. Same plans, same facts, same data. Option A, you have to opt in to save money. Option B, you have to opt out not to save money. Option A, of people making under $40,000, 18, 1-8% actually signed that, opted in to actually save money. Option B, 88% stayed in to save money. Same people, same condition, same data. The decision they made had nothing to do with that. It only had to do with the choice architecture presented to them. Depending who you talk and how radical you want to be, if you or I make 100 decisions today, five of them, we will rationally involve our uh, rational part of our brain, and 95 of them, they will be done for us based on the context. 95% of our decisions are non-rational, and yet we have spent all this time to create technologies that actually perfect and give us more accurate algorithms, better data, which we are going to ignore anyway because we're going to make decisions <laughs> based on context. Let me prove it to you, and, and, and I'm going to start telling you. Square A and square B are identical, same color. Can you see it? Your brain doesn't actually let you see it. Your brain, if you have ever understood all that logic that you have on your brain, which is recreating reality, is just taking what you know about light, what you know about shade, and basically projecting that the fact of the matter is A is a black square on that checker box, and B is a white square. That is what your brain is telling you. Now, let me split it apart and take the context of that app. What is your brain telling you right now? Oh, your brain is now telling you, wow, A and B are identical colors. They're the same squares. I kid you not. I actually sat down with the designers and I said, you're fooling me. I'm pretty sure you're darkening it. <laughs> so I had them do this. I said, I want half of the context. So to see if my brain can actually see that actually it is true. <laughs> You know, when you destroy the formula of the context, right, when the brain cannot actually process that there is a shade. Actually, I do see A and B are identical, but the moment that you go back to the left, you can't actually see they're identical. Your brain will let you do that. And that is the way that 
we hack into how humans make decisions. Tell you what it is, right? Really focus on this integration of people and technology. Um, it's not only moral and good, but it's actually a better way to actually get things done. I told you how important it is. Think of every decision being made, every behavior that needs to change. Uh, this is a better way to do it. Then the last three things is the beginning of the conversation on, okay, so how do we do this? Like, if tomorrow I have to design a product, how do I design a product that better interface emotionally with a human? The first one is a very simple law of physics. Uh, anybody here, like an engineer, or, you know, physics or math? Okay, a few of you. So you know this law that says every state tends to the a state of minimum energy, right? Every system will try to stay in the state of minimum energy. Humans are the same. We are lazy by design. We will do that thing that is the easiest for us over time before we actually do what's right. And do you want to prove of that? Why do you think people invented the one-click buy? Because it's easy. Now, let me tell you, and you could try, and I know what it is. The answer for me is, if you have the one-click buy option for a product that is maybe exactly the same product but a dollar more, and another option which will take you five screens but you're going to save a dollar, which one will you act on? My wife will take all five steps. <laughs> <laughs> and one-click buy just to prove the point, right? Because you need to. So um, if you want people to do what's right, just design what you believe to be right to be the easy choice. That's matching the interface to the intent. Second thing is, you know, everybody knows that we have a lot of biases, right? Um, you know, these biases, if you're a hacker, what you do with a bias or what would you do with any other attribute is you use them to reverse engineer the interface. So here's your list of attributes, of things that you can use on your interface to actually, in a good sense, persuade people to do what's right. In the bad sense, you can manipulate people to do what you want them to do, but it's actually doable. It's being done in marketing every day, and uh, people know how to do that. And then um, the last one, before I, I have Ryan coming back up, is um, think about this is now we are understanding a lot more about cognition uh, that is actually an architecture of how humans establish relationship, right? So I kind of like showed you a little bit of the operating system of the cognition. There is a layer on top which is more sophisticated. And uh, think of the concept of trust and how trust is developed. And then think about how do you create that if, in the case of AI, you know, why people are start having conversations every morning with Alexa or Siri, even though they know it is a computer, and why they would immediately stop that if that Alexa or Siri would pretend to be a human, because it would then become creepy. It would become offensive. It, it would become untrusted. So make sure that you understand that relationship and sequence uh, of steps that lead to a relationship in the way in which you need to create technology that actually matches with a human. We had a great discussion yesterday on, imagine if you're creating an application for a patient, what will it take for a patient to actually trust that application? Because that will lead to the outcome of the patient following it more than any beautiful algorithms that you could put on that. So um, that's the beginning of the conversation. Let me bring uh, Ravin uh, Jesuthasan, his uh, good friend at William Towers Watson. And uh, I'm going to ask him, how do we bring these concepts to actual reality? Ravin, let's give him a hand. Good to see you. Good to see you. So, um, so, Ravin, you have um, done a lot of research for your book, and uh, you've, uh, you do on your day job, you do a lot of work on uh, future of work and how AI and technology is really reinventing what the work gets done and how people look at that. How would you say these concepts match, and how could people take these concepts and apply them to the future of work? Yeah, I, I think they match exceptionally well. Um, I, I think the way you positioned it around the opportunity to humanize work in the organization uh, aligns really well with the, what, the research that we did in reinventing jobs. So the reason my co-author, John Boudreau, and I wrote the book was we were a little irritated by this ongoing 
um, sort of dichotomy, if you will, of you know, the machines are going to take all of our jobs, but yet we're really excited by the cool technology and it's going to create lots of new opportunity. I think at the heart of it is that the frame of reference which we've had for arguably three industrial revolutions where the job was the primary unit of measurement for work is no longer relevant. Because within a job, you have a whole diversity of activities. You've got highly repetitive rules-based work that is easily substituted by automation. You've got yet other more human tasks that, are, that can be made incredibly powerful through augmentation. And yet, the also in addition to that, as you bring on more automation, as you've illustrated here, the opportunity to create completely different types of uh, work for humans demanding ever new skills. And the thing we found was until you got beyond the job into the tasks and the skills, it was really difficult to get to the optimal combinations of humans and machines. And with that, I think an opportunity to almost liberate work from that box it's traditionally been in, where people were sort of boxed into these repetitive rules-based work in pursuit of efficiency and productivity right. to unleash human creativity and innovation. That's good, that's good. Um, one of the elements in, uh, for example, that we have done um, in IBM is we, um, we look at design as the canvas and the palette with which you can actually create this impedance matching, for, to use a, uh, an engineering term, this, this matching of technology and humans, not only based on data, which is clicks and screens and numbers, but based on that emotional relationship and uh, applied to things like uh, employee experience. So again, it's like think about that 401k example, mm -hmm. right? So people will choose based on the choice architecture and how that choice architecture is designed more than any data that you give them about what's right or wrong. And, and we have this very confused, especially in large organizations. We think that we create some policy at the top, mm -hmm. we just send all these emails, and then the people are idiots if they don't read it, but they have to do it. And, you know, I think the, the technology firms that have figured out this thing right is they come from the other angle. It's like, no, create an environment, an interface between what you're trying to do and the human that right. includes technology, and actually that becomes a more effective adoption curve. Have you seen on your work uh, any other companies doing that? Yeah, I, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head on, I think one of the biggest changes in organization design that we're starting to see is as work gets democratized, leadership is moving to the edges. And the challenge becomes, how do you empower and enable consistent decision making, not from two or three people in the center, but thousands of people at the fringes of the organization because they're the ones innovating every day, they're the ones interacting with your customers, they're the ones transforming your processes. Um, one of the best examples we had in the book was the transformation of hire. Hire is, as, as you know, the, uh, the largest appliance manufacturer in the world. It's a Chinese company that literally went from post its acquisition of GE's appliance business, went from kind of a fairly staid old second industrial revolution, almost the equivalent of a state-owned enterprise in China, into the epitome of what a fourth industrial revolution distributed platform-based enterprise looks like w through a series of 220 micro-businesses, all of which use design thinking at the heart to create an empowered and engaged and innovative workforce. Yeah, I mean, you were saying about that. I was very impressed. I, I, um, uh, I went to Beijing four years ago, then three years ago, then this year, and I basically saw in the last 18 months uh, 100 million people stop using cash. So think about the actual change without control that you have on having 100 million people change a habit like cash. And then I compare that to my experience as a European with uh, Europe figuring out you know, the euro and the change management, a process that probably took five to 10 years right. to not actually get people to stop using cash, just to use another currency, right. to stop using cash, <laughs> that would be too much change, right? So uh, think about that, how uh, that different perspective, and I think it's a little bit my point on the, the radically superior outcomes that right. can be achieved when you actually figured out this rule that people will do what's easy more yep. than they will do what's right. So if you design a path of this, uh, you're gonna get, like in the example of the 401k, 88% of the people just walk through it. Right. Now, this brings the other point, which is when we talk about future of work, it's almost impossible not to talk about ethics and AI. You know, 
that path of roses that I just described could right. be a path to hell as well, yes. right? So imagine the manipulation possibilities of, uh, of taking this and intimately, in a very scary way, be manipulating people to do choices that they actually believe they have the free will to do, right? right. And uh, I, think, I think this became popular. It was science fiction up until people became familiar with a company called Cambridge Analytica and uh, Brexit and elections, and suddenly it's like, oh, whoa, this right. is not that much science fiction. So how should we reframe the ethics in AI and future of work and ethics dialogue that right now seems to have just two bullet points, is uh, how do we make sure that machine don't take all of our jobs mm -hmm. and the algorithm has bias? That seems to be a very narrow view yeah. that needs to be expanded. What's your point of view on that? Yeah, I, I do think this point about ethics needs to be expanded um, because as we move to the distributed enterprise where technology is much more of a, a strong, it's a stronger feature, it's a, a factor in, in how we, we work, I think the ethics of virtually every aspect of leadership become critical. And the one that I'm really intrigued with, and we've spent a fair bit of time in, in Davos and with the World Economic Forum on the last few years is, how does, in a world where the half-life of skills are shrinking dramatically, um, much faster than ever before, where new skills are being created you know, at exponential pace, how, who's responsible for the ongoing relevance of the workshop? And what's the moral obligation of leaders um, in ensuring that current workers, as well as future workers, are aligned with an enterprise that is sustainable over the long haul? And, and what are the ethics associated with those decisions? Because as many know, we've, in, in most of the Western economy, certainly we've got a lot of perverse incentives associated with how we account, right? I'm incentivized and motivated as a business leader to do a riff and then go out and hire, as opposed to invest the dollars in reskilling my population for a fundamentally different role. And I think that's going to be one of the biggest ethical challenges we have of who's really responsible. Is it the company? Is it, the, is it government? And it'll be fascinating to see how that plays out, I think. Yeah, and I think, to your point, that's inside of the, uh, of the companies. And then outside, I, I know already a lot of uh, startups are jumping into this, but uh, there is a lot of focus on the ethical side of algorithms. I think I, I project, I you know, envision, to use uh, you know, the theme, <laughs> that um, we are going to have a lot more companies attacking the more complex task of also making sure that we have ethics on the interface, meaning uh, we seem to be putting a lot of focus on what, on the facts we present in front of people. Um, I think we're going to put a lot more focus on how we present them and what is an ethical way to present a choice that leads to, you know, as free as you can make of an outcome, right. given uh, the elements of cognition that we mentioned. Uh, hopefully, we got you guys uh, woken up. Uh, uh, if not, you know, just run and get some coffee. I think this is our segment, so Robin, always a pleasure to Black have you places. here. And Rob, I think I, I get you back to stage. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. And I was sincere about that, guys. Uh, I think you saw one of the things I love about where I am in the universe is the ability to have deeper conversations about business, about tech, but actually about other things, too. We've had lots of conversations. In fact, you and I walked up a couple of mountains in Bhutan yeah. last year, thanks to abroad. It was, yes. it was very hard to, like, actually think while you're bracing out all those steps, but that's because I was in bad shape, but anyway. Uh, but that's okay, because we don't care about data anyway. We just, whatever we feel like, right? Human. I mean, how the choices were being presented right. to us were really good when you're in a mountain in Bhutan, so right. thank you, Thanks, Ralph. guys. Thank Thanks so much. Robin and Jesus, uh, in different ways, talked about the distribution of organizations, pushing decision-making to the edges. Um, the dynamic that is catalyzing this is digital technology. There are other factors, but digital technology more than any is driving the change in organizations. This happened in the 19th century with the railroads. The railroads catalyzed and essentially created the modern multi-divisional corporation. It also, they also created time zones. By the way, you didn't really need to know what time it was 100 miles away when it took you a long time to get there. And so digital technologies allow us to push 
sensing, analytics, agency, the ability to make decisions, the ability to produce, think 3D printing, think rooftop solar energy generation at smaller and smaller locations all around the economy, ever closer to each moment of demand in time and space. Thus, what they do in aggregate is push the production and provision of products and services ever closer to the moment at which they might be demanded. We call this proximity. This proximity dynamic being driven by digital technologies is the dynamic that is changing every industry represented in this room for the rest of our careers. And I'm not hedging. Every industry in this room is the, the production and provision of products and services is being pushed closer and closer to the moment of demand. 